Welcome to the course, Environmental Impact Assessment. Continuing in our process to learn law, policy and institutional arrangements for EIA system, today we will cover domain of ecology. According to the key legislation, guidance and standards available in the domain of ecology, it can be divided into four components. We see that it, uh, we can see um, key legislation and guidance and standards, uh, uh, legislations are available at international and multinational agreements and conventions. Then you see it at the level of uh, national and regional legislation and then you also see um, components like industry codes and best practices then also see that there are special interest groups. So accordingly the coverage uh, of today's session will include that uh, will cover uh, um, international and multilateral agreement and convention, we will look into the national and regional legislations, codes of uh, practice and best practices as well as we will just touch upon special interest groups. So the learning outcomes after completion of this particular session would be that you would be able to identify, uh, list the international and multilateral agreements and conventions and uh, you should be able to review its implications on our country EIA process. So that you should be able to do, further you should be able to identify national and regional legislation and then uh, you should be able to list different codes of practice and best practices, you should know that which one to refer to when you are dealing with certain domain and then uh, you should also be able to identify special interest groups and so that you can take a review and uh, they could be part of your EIA process. So um, in any country when you um, um, you, you look at when they enter the international convention or multilateral agreements, uh, it affects their assessment process and also their pro policy. So that's why we are reviewing it because uh, at the larger level what you decide how it really percolates down. So they need uh, all the agreement and convention we get into, they need to align uh, these things, uh, we need to align our targets with uh, as per the global policy and the global targets. So many of these biodiversity related conventions require the country to implement targets in planning process, uh, they also need to implement it in the protection me mechanism and then also include in the EIA process. So that all uh, will influence how you do the things. So uh, therefore we will be looking at these aspects, international and multilateral agreements and convention and uh, you also try to link it back with what we have seen during the timeline and how we were developing understanding in this perspective. So uh, if you recollect uh, at the Rio uh, Earth Summit in 2002, many goals and sustainable development principles were initiated and which led to international agreements supporting sustainable development and biodiversity. And uh, looking at some of the key agreements which included uh, like you see Convention on Biological Diversity CBD of 1992 uh, which was adopted at Rio Earth Summit. And India is one of the earliest signatories of Convention on Biological Diversity CBT and became a party in February 1994. <coughs> so uh, MOEFCC has uh, been designated as the nodal ministry, so this ministry looks at the uh, CBT Convention on Biological Diversity in the country. And in the image in the center you can see all the signatories to the convention and India's national report on the left hand side. So um, um, in later uh, biodiversity targets were set in 2002, uh, targets were set for 2010 like what targets uh, will meet. The purpose was to attain considerable reduction that was the intention um, uh, in the current rate of biodiversity loss. And then um, important point for us was that the, uh, they used, uh, they, suggest, they recommended or they imposed the tools such as EIA and also strategic environmental assessment uh, for consideration and planning of development. So uh, looking at CBD, 10th conference of parties COP10, uh, their decision um, to develop strategic plan for biodiversity 2011 and 2000, uh, to 2020 
Uh, this was directed, uh, um, the prime agenda was to achieve several strategic goals like uh, have goals in place and, uh, and specifically goals in place to address the root cause of biodiversity loss, what was really causing this biodiversity loss and how we can have strategies in place to address and reduce those uh, or to control those root cause. And then further, uh, the idea was to reduce the direct pressure. Uh, on biodiversity and then also you look at to promote sustainable use uh, of all the resources which are there. Further you see that the idea was to improve the status of biodiversity by safeguarding ecosystem um, uh, and especially looking at species and genetic diversity so that all uh, st not only protection uh, or reduction but also improvement of that scenario and then enhance the benefits to society. So, it is just not one sided, but then how the uh, benefit would be uh, improved for the society from the biodiversity and ecosystem services and enhance implementation through participatory planning, knowledge management and capacity building. So, how that uh, people have to be involved and how the knowledge has to be managed and how the capacity of the people has to be built. So, uh, we also see that Bonn Convention uh, uh, which was on conservation of migratory species of wild animals 1979. So, this convention uh, targeted to protect uh, threatened animals that uh, migrate across uh, seas and or national boundaries and specifically for our interest using EIA as a tool for uh, recognizing areas uh, which needed maintenance and their uh, also the areas apart from their areas and also their migration routes. So, through the uh, process of EIA using EIA as a tool uh, we need to identify and then also to protect these areas. So, on the right hand side image you can see the signatory parties to the convention. Further you see Ramsar convention on wetlands of international importance in 1971. And through this uh, convention, uh, the target was to conserve the wetlands of the international importance um, and then uh, these sites are called as Ramsar sites and then again using environmental impact assessment and also as using strategic uh, environmental assessment as a tool to consider like uh, what will happen with the biodiversity, with the development uh, uh, in this and then how we plan to have development of this area and then how we ensure safeguard and protection of these wetlands. And uh, in India if you look at uh, uh, this entered into force on 1st February 1982, India currently has 49 sites designated as wetlands of international importance, this keeps changing so you may be very careful about that. Two new Ramsar sites. Uh, have been added, one in Gujarat and another in Uttar Pradesh, um, uh, which was recently announced on the World Wetland Day at Sultanpur National Park in Gurgaon in February 2022. So, in the image you can see all the Ramsar sites across the world as of date. Further, we see that UNESCO Man and Biosphere Program 1970. Um, it is uh, this established biosphere reserves. So, through this biosphere reserves were established and then also there was need to identify different innovative approaches to conserve and uh, address the sustainable development. And there are uh, generally recognized uh, the uh, these are also like these biosphere reserves are also recognized as globally important areas and uh, that should be avoided when development is planned. So, we cannot really plan in these areas or around this. So, you have to be very uh, careful about those and you need to take in considerations where all these areas lie. And then Man and Biosphere program is being implemented by the Government of India since 1986. So, we have been involved in this. The first Biosphere Reserve of the world was established in 1979. So, according to UNESCO, there are currently 727 biosphere reserves in 131 countries including 22 transboundary sites that belong to world network of biosphere reserve. So, the government of India established 18 biospheres in the country cat 
categories generally related to IUCN. So IUCN provides the categories. So according to that, we have uh, identified. Uh, further, we also see UNESCO World Heritage Convention 1972. Uh, the convention targets to protect natural and cultural areas uh, and the, these areas of outstanding value as World Heritage Sites. Uh, so, in, uh, you can see some uh, sites, uh, uh, sites identified because there are some sites which are identified because of their biodiversity importance. So, um, uh, we see that it came into force in 1975 and India ratified the convention in 1977. Thereafter, we see Bern Convention on the Conservation of European Wildlife and Natural Habitats, 1979. And uh, this one aims to protect endangered species and their habitat. Uh, it later included Emerald Network of area of special conservation interest uh, and supporting the European habitat directives. So, with that it added the emerald and if we see what is emerald, uh, emerald uh, network is an ecological network made up of areas of special conservation interest uh, and its implementation was launched by Council of Europe and then we see that 49 out of 51 European countries are signatories of the convention and four African countries are part of this which include Burkina Faso, Senegal, Tunisia and Morocco. So, for more information you can find it out on the website of Council of Europe, links are provided in following slides and in the suggested watch also. So, uh, after that we also see the Pan-European Biological and Landscape Diversity Strategy developed by Council of Europe, UNEP and European Centre for Na Nature Conservation. And through this, the target was to link the European and national protected areas together and the ecological network. Uh, all of this in order to ensure conservation of Europe's key species, habitats and ecosystem. And then you can also find the uh, book uh, PEB LDS explained, um, it is a guide for IUCN members to pan-European biological and landscape diversity. So, this guide is also available, you can have a look at that. Link is also provided for you. And uh, if we look at the European level, uh, there are several policies and directives uh, which require establishment of areas to protect biodiversity and planning of development. Uh, and uh, particularly to ensure that all the threatened species can be maintained uh, at a favorable conservation status. So, we can maintain that and uh, so in that we find EU bio biodiversity strategy which requires European commissions to produce biodiversity action plans. So, they are going to make BAP biodiversity action plans. Then you have wild birds directive. Uh, the target is to protect wild bird species and their habitats and with particular protection of rare species. So, for that also you uh, they need to prepare special protection areas, they need to identify special protection areas. I have also given you the link to look at it in detail to explore further. And then uh, we also find habitat directives, uh, the target of these directive was to protect habitats and species and especially by using measures to maintain and uh, restore favorable conservation status. And uh, again you have, uh, you prepare special area conservations, uh, you declare special areas of conservations here. And, uh, and you would also uh, uh, use uh, land use and development policies and landscape management outside these special areas of conservation. So again I have provided you the link here. Then you can also see water framework directive which also requires that you maintain aquatic, wetland and terrestrial ecosystem with intention to achieve good status. That was about the international level. Now looking at the national and regional legislation, most countries have passed national level uh, environmental as uh, assessment legislation. So, even we have done that and then that requires conservation of ecology and biodiversity uh, in the process of doing EIA. So, that is required. So, whenever the country has signed, so that has to be translated in the EIA process. 
So protection, conservation and management of wildlife within each country uh, is enacted under the national legislation. So how we protect, how we conserve, how we manage, we uh, take care of all, uh, all of it under the national legislation. And this will uh, affect the scope of EIA. So whatever we do in EIA will be affected by what kind of national legislation is there and, um, uh, and uh, how, how we uh, do the undertake the assessment. So uh, you can see like in EIA notification, you can see that uh, like uh, I had shown you the list uh, category A, B and so on. So uh, in general conditions, uh, any project or activity is specified if, if they fall under B category. So uh, we see that protection, conservation and management of wildlife within each country is enacted under national legislation. So uh, if uh, we have national legislation in place to look after this wildlife protection, conservation and management. And uh, whatever this national la legislation is, it's going to affect the EIA process. So how you process it, what, what all you will cover, the scope of EIA would be guided by this national legislation. So for example, you can see that in EIA notification, uh, we have like you had seen uh, category A and category B, uh, B1, B2. So uh, whenever you have certain um, um, uh, such kind of areas like pro protected areas, if they are notified under wildlife, then you have eco sensitive areas as notified under like Environmental Protection Act some of the areas, if they fall under this, then they have to be dealt separately in the category A, even though if they are come under the category B. So you see that how uh, it influences the scope of the work and then the process which you would follow. So national legislation um, either enacts uh, multilateral agreements or provides the de dedicated legislation on the biodiversity. So the national, uh, national legislation can uh, uh, um, an act, whatever agreement has happened or they can have uh, their own legislation on the biodiversity. For example, you can see in UK you have conservation of habitat and species regulation 2010 uh, which follows from EC directives on conservation of natural habitat and wildlife flora, wildlife fauna and flora. And then you also see national uh, legislation on biodiversity and ecology. Uh, can be either comprehensive or specific as well. So you can have comprehensive legislation uh, which contains uh, measures to protect habitat, species and areas. So everything is in one in an umbrella act. So you can have comprehensive uh, legislation. For example, you have Wildlife Conservation and Management Act which is you can see from Kenya. Then you have India's Wildlife Protection Act 1972 which is also a comprehensive act and then you can also see UK Wildlife and Countryside Act 1985 which is again comprehensive act. So um, there are specific legislations also, uh, so you can have comprehensive or you can have specific uh, you would see those variations across. So specific le legislation relates to protection of specific areas, habitats or species such as like you can have uh, where specific legislation would identify some areas and uh, uh, based on those areas you have to take care of things. So the most widely used example is the national park legislation. So if the national park uh, is being determined then you cannot uh, uh, like you have to take care of the development what is happening there. And then the example of this include like 1980 New Zealand uh, National Park Act and then you can also see 2003 South Africa Protected Act as well as you can see areas of international conservation concerns such as uh, Galapagos also have national area protection. So uh, we see that uh, uh, there can be legislation specifically for species. So these regulations usually supplement the overarching national legislation. So you can have very sp uh, species specific also. Like you can see for example 1992 UK Protection of Badgers Act. So it is only focusing on badgers. And then you all can also have habitat or land use specific legislation. These reg reg legislation relate to specific habitats or land uses but have implications on uh, ecological conservation. Example is like forest law of uh, Brazil uh, or you can see forest law of India. 
So uh, you can also see examples of countries that adopt national and uh, regional uh, systems. So you have all range of uh, um, uh, all, all the uh, legislation provided, system provided to you. So you can have a look at them. The list is given to you here. Uh, Convention on Biological Diversity and COP 10 of 2010. Uh, signatory countries to uh, agreed uh, for the national strategic plan and uh, this also uh, helped uh, to achieve the I, I, I key targets uh, which uh, are important to consider in the context of EIA and assessment of potential for development of to affect the biodiversity. Uh, uh, we see that uh, uh, because of the Convention on Bio Biological Diversity and COP 10 of 2010, the signatory countries, we are also the signatory, signatory countries agreed uh, to prepare national strategic plan uh, and uh, to uh, stra national strategic plan would help us to attain I key targets. In India, as per the MOEFCC annual reports, we see the area of work dealt within conservation of biodiversity are aligned with uh, the conventions and related activities. So you can see here, uh, you have convention on biological diversity, which uh, India is part and then Nagoya protocol and acts, assesses and benefit sharing ABS, then you can see national biodiversity action plan and national biodiversity targets, you have national reports to CBD, then you have intergovernmental platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services, domestic measures um, uh, like biological diversity act 2002 and national biodiversity authority NBA. So all that you see which is there in the provision, how we align our things with the global requirement. So um, uh, you also see that in countries as per the policy and mechanism that countries also adopt a national and regional uh, uh, like uh, it could be state system um, and uh, wildlife legislation can occur both at the national and the regional uh, legislation level. So you see that. Um, for example, national level example, you can see national wildlife legislation of Uganda and you can see at the same time the regional level, the regional uh, national park legislation of Australia which is like for the state of New South Wales. So you can look at many other policies for review purpose. You can see all those lists have been provided to you here, national and, and environmental policy, then national wildlife act local government act national so this is all international national examples given to you so you see the range of acts which are there in different countries at different levels so you can see them here you can see the wetland act oil and gas policy for uganda fish act cap then uh, animal prevention and cruelty act cap then cattle grazing act protection act prohibition of burning of grass act animal disease cap so all these you can see it is important that uh, so, so you, you, you would realize or you must be thinking that uh, you would not know about particular domain. So it is um, important that the, uh, uh, you have experts involved in the scoping of EIA and uh, so that there is full understanding of the involved legislation uh, affecting the protection of wildlife in the uh, country which you are studying. So now looking at the codes of practice and best practices. So you will find number of ecological codes of practice and best practice guidelines such as you can find EIA guidelines of UK Institutes of Eco Ecology and Environmental Management. You would also find MOEFCC in India also provides manual and guidelines for various sectorial in which they have it or have all, all, all these information given. So these. Uh, uh, you, you can use this for the EIA purpose. Okay. Uh, at the international level, you can also find IFC. Um, uh, you can see environmental and sustainability performance standards. Then uh, you can also see European Bank for Reconstruction and Development also provides African Development Bank, also provides Asian Development Bank as well as Inter-American Development Plan. Uh, Inter-American Development Bank also provides information on this. 
So, uh, bilateral funding agencies also require this to be taken care of like the Danish International Development Agency um, and then you see um, USAID, then you also see JICA. Uh, all these uh, have requirements related to project financed under the bilateral loans and uh, uh, you need to take care of ecological and environmental studies uh, associated um, with the project uh, if that loan, uh, if you are uh, taking loan for your project. So, looking at IFC, you see that performance standards uh, which are particularly related with this uh, are uh, performance standard 1 which uh, involves uh, assessment and management of environmental and social risk and impact. And then you also see uh, performance standard 6 which deals with biodiversity and sustainable management of living natural resources. So, you can uh, find those things, uh, the link is also given to you. And if you look at PS6 uh, that particularly uh, targets on pr protecting biodiversity, maintaining the benefits of ecosystem services la and uh, 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 these things are given here. You can also look at uh, the certain classification which PS6 introduces like you have habitat classification, modified land, natural habitat, critical habitat, legally protected and internet. Um, internationally recognized areas. So, all these uh, classifications are there. So, you need to take care of those classification while performing EIA. So, uh, further moving on we see that in many countries uh, professional institutions and then societies there are also special interest groups which can be of help and then which can review. So, it is a good practice to when you prepare EIA to uh, get it reviewed. So, uh, that review can be taken uh, care of. So, uh, uh, looking at various special interest groups. So, uh, it, it is uh, required that you um, when you prepare EIA you get it reviewed so that you get inputs in terms of its scoping, in terms of its process and in terms of the identified impact. And uh, uh, in this way you can engage with different authorities, planning authorities and ministries and consultants as well as NGOs and even uh, research institutes. So, that enriches your report and makes it much more refined. And you can also engage with the local experts and uh, they can be helpful at many stages of EIA. And your, uh, it, uh, the appraisal by them will uh, help you to improve the um, uh, scope, the technical uh, competence of your uh, report as well as how, um, how valid is your report and what kind of measures and mitigations you have supported. So, uh, there are a range of special interest groups uh, uh, and there can be specific uh, interest groups also. Then uh, there can be interest groups related with just species like bats, butterflies, bats, reptiles and amphibians. For example, uh, you can find Royal Society for Protection of Birds in UK and then you can also find Audubon Society in US. Then uh, you can also find local museums and data center which can be helpful for you. And then there can be also non-professional special interest groups like local natural history or wildlife groups or cultural groups which can be helpful for reviewing your EIA report. So, um, uh, that was what we saw today. So, summarizing what we covered, we looked at the uh, domain of ecology and what kind of laws and standards and all those apply. So, we looked at the international and multilateral agreements and conventions which we align our uh, activities to. Then we looked at national and regional legislation, what are the different categories and how they are different. So, that we saw and then we looked at codes of practice and best practices and we looked at the special interest groups. And you can also uh, uh, look at some of the uh, other laws in this area like you can look at Dune Valley notification, you can also look at the protection of and Top Hill Bombay and then also uh, Aravalli ranges uh, and then you can also look at uh, other sensitive zone like Dhanao ecology protection and then eco sensitive zone uh, Panchmali notification and then Mabaleshwar, Panchgani areas, all these ec eco sensitive zones you can look into.
for your further understanding. This was the key reference for us. We took um, from the book of Methods of Environment and Social Impact Assessments. And you can look at the suggested uh, read here provided to you. So all the reports and other documents you can read only if you want to know more. And there are some uh, watch which has been suggested to you. You can see some videos here. So um, ending up uh, here, please feel free to ask questions. Let us know about any concerns you have. Do share your opinions, experiences, and um, feel free to make your suggestions. Looking forward to interacting and co-learning with you while exploring EIA. Thank you.